And hello, everybody. I, I can't see anybody. It's a very strange thing. It's very, the the um, virtual world is an odd one because you're, you're, you're almost preaching to yourself, which is, a, is quite a frightening prospect. However, it's, I'm delighted to talk to everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I have spoken to, in, in, in real terms, uh, to, to a similar forum before and found it really, really invigorating and exciting. Um, you're at a, those people who are starting out their architectural career and studying architecture are incredibly lucky because it's a wonderful, wonderful world. I've been involved in it for the best part of 40 years. In fact, probably more than that. Um, I am a director of RKG Architects, principal in the practice for quite some time. Um, I joined the practice shortly after leaving college. I, I actually studied at, at, um, at Bolton Street and in Paris. And came back to to work with Andy Devan, and then worked with have, have worked there since, and I've worked in a, a multitude of pro, uh, projects. And the one thing that that never changes is the excitement and the the sense of uh, of new adventure every time you you're, you're involved in a project. Um, the world of architecture is people will tell you is very precarious. It's uh, and 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 it's 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 very prone to economic downturns and everything else, but. So be it. It's also very exciting and it's, it's full of innovation. At this moment in time, we employ about 150 people. Uh, we do a lot of work in the commercial world. We do a lot of healthcare work. I personally head a team who do a huge amount of university projects. I think there's hardly a university in Ireland where we haven't, we haven't um, de uh, designed some capital buildings. And that's really, really good fun. And right at this moment in time, we're working on, um, on a number of projects in UCD. Which, and some very innovative projects. And that's really, really very exciting. As a practice, we have uh, people of all age groups and all levels of experience working with us. We have interior designers, we have environmentalists, we have architects, we have architectural technicians, and we have, um, we have other people advising us. And that team is great fun. It's great fun to be part of it. It's great fun to be, uh, to, 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 to be generating things with, with that level of expertise. And as architectural students, as architectural, um, as architects, your people are very, remember you're very well qualified and you can do lots of things. You don't have to be pigeonholed into one thing. And I think if one thing we might explore today is, or this evening, are the opportunities which, which exist, both as a student, as an architect, working with, with practices, but also as a graduate and what the graduate experience is like. But let me preface this by saying one thing, it's great fun and it has to be great fun. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good business to be in. Thank you so I much, Dennis. Leonie, I, don't, I, don't, I won't see any more for the moment, but I'm sure we'll, we'll be plenty more oh, opportunities. Oh, absolutely. No, everybody is here for you and, and, and for Evan and for Amanda, uh, Dennis. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I suppose understanding the, the energy um, and the exposing understanding of the industry as well. Um, and that there are many opportunities exist there for graduates as well, which um, definitely we'd like to explore this evening. Thanks very much, Dennis. Um, Amanda, um, over to you. If you could please introduce yourself and let us know where you are currently at the moment and, and, and your career pathway to date. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, um, hello to everyone that I can't see. <laughs> um, it was a real honor to be asked. So I'm actually delighted to get a chance to speak to everybody. Um, I'm a graduate of UCD. Um, I just worked it out today. Uh, I qualified 24 years ago, but it honestly feels like yesterday because I still have the very same group of close friends. Um, so after graduation, I worked in Northern Spain. I worked in Paris. I worked in New York. And then I came back to Dublin. And at that stage, I was interested in working in a small practice. So I contacted a young architect who had recently won the dance medal. He had designed the print works with DTA Architects and he left to set up by himself. So I kind of badgered him for a job and eventually he gave in, and which was great because from literally day one, I was put out on site and I got enormous opportunity and enormous experience. I worked with him for a couple of years and I got my, my uh, part three. So that's the one thing I would advise to, to graduates. When you leave, if you can, get your part three as quickly as possible because you're still young, you still have the energy and you're still in the mindset of doing exams and preparing for exams. 
A couple of years after working with Ez, I got the opportunity um, of doing uh, uh, what was for me quite a large job. So I just jumped at the chance and set up my own practice. To be honest, I didn't even really give it much consideration. It was a, a, a job for a, a new build office building in the city center. And I think maybe if I was a little bit older, I mightn't have, <laughs> but I just jumped to it and took it. And that's what I started. So I established my practice in 2000. And my practice has changed dramatically over the years as I tried to figure out what it actually was that I was interested in doing. I started off with, with seven employees and I started off doing commercial work. I ended up working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I never turned off. As actually my dad turned around to me and said, you're gonna die young. So I pulled back. I asked myself, what was it that I liked? I liked working with clients. I liked detailing. I liked being on a site. And when you work in a larger practice, sometimes you can't do all that. So over the years, and to be honest, it took me till the age of 40 to say, what is it that I want? So I changed my practice. I now have a practice of one. I do uh, one-off houses, kind of no, new build. Uh, I work with protected structures. I'm accredited in conservation grade three. Um, and I only take on a couple of jobs a year. Um, I also do a lot of exhibition work. I don't know if any of these students went to the OAI conferences in the last couple of years and um, where I got the opportunity to design the stage, which was something a little bit different. As well as my own practice, I am a consultant to a larger firm, which is great because it gives me a huge variety of experience. And I also teach fourth year uh, in the design studio in the Dublin School of Architecture. And I started recently um, working with the professional practice exams. Um, I'm also on the editorial board of the RAI uh, magazine, House and Design. And then last summer, I said yes to being a judge on Home of the Year, which is brilliant because architecture is, 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 is fantastic. There's nothing else I want to do, but it's also can be incredibly stressful and it's, it's really time consuming. And yes, you end up with beautiful buildings at the end, but asked to be judge on Home of the Year, I thought, well, here's something I can have a bit of fun. I can use my experience during the pandemic, I could get dressed, put on some makeup and go out. So it was it was great. And, and I have to say it it was it was so much fun. Amanda, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I think I could I could listen to you all day. It's a fantastic story. Um, and congratulations for setting up the business and, and also um, being asked to be judge for um, Home of the Year. So well done on that. Um, and I think it's fantastic that you had the opportunity to travel early on. Um, it was great that you had an opportunity to, to work, um, kind of hands-on work experience and the importance of that as well, I think is fantastic. I think it's great advice on getting qualifications early on as soon as possible as well. Um, I thought it was interesting that there was supposed that, that self-reflection later on of what do I actually like? What do I actually want to do? We were discussing that earlier in a class on career planning. That self-reflection piece is so important. Um, so thanks very much, Amanda, for that. Um, and Evan, you're very welcome. Um, and thank you so much again for your time. Um, so Evan, would you like to introduce yourself and, and let people know where you are currently at the moment um, and maybe your career pathway up to where you are? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, I just want to start off to say thank you for inviting me and including me to this panel. I'm very excited about it and it's uh, it's a good way for me to also give a little back to UCD where I stayed three of my years uh, during my education uh, to just jump a little bit back before that. Um, during high school I took a year out in America because I was very intrigued to sort of discover the world and also get to do part of my education in English. Um, and this is sort of also what led me to go to Ireland to, to go into something that I'd like to better get to know architecture. So I moved to, uh, to Dublin in, back in 2011 uh, and left there after three years in 2014. Um, I had a fantastic time. And actually I went back now after six years, um, December a year ago, I went back, visited the school uh, it was at the beginning of the month, so there was actually nobody there. All the work was laid out for to be revised by the supervisor or professors and so on. So, but it was um, it was exciting to go back and see um, uh, where I spent a lot of my time, <laughs> as I'm sure most of you are at the moment. Um, but um, 
after I left UCD, I took a year out, uh, as is quite common. Uh, I worked on a couple of construction sites. It was very, I'm, I'm intrigued with working with details and, and, and that's also what I appreciated being at UCD is how, how you also involve the technicality of, of realizing a building uh, into the study program. And therefore it was nice to also get some hands-on experience. So I, I was um, at two different work sites um, for, for a year. And then I started my master's uh, actually in, in Norway uh, at NTNU uh, in Trondheim, uh, sort of halfway mid up the, the country where uh, uh, I had a fantastic time, very good environment to study in, um, uh, but I was still missing the, um, or I, I wasn't finished being abroad and studying. So I did an Erasmus, I went to Brussels, uh, had a good time there as well, but um, ended up uh, finishing in Norway. Um, and what I realized at that moment is that actually, I'm not sure where I wanna go or where I wanna work. I could go anywhere, but it was um, natural for me to sort of get to know uh, the job market because that's something that I was missing during you know, when you're studying, you're in this bubble and you're very focused on your work and it's so much happening throughout the semesters that I took part in arranging a workshop uh, that we called the um, uh, Rapid Practice for Architecture Students in Norway. It was already established. I had been a participant the year before, but then at the end of my master's, I took part in arranging it. And it was a fantastic moment and uh, opportunity to, to get to know what sort of uh, opportunities you have as an architect, what pe people are doing after they graduate. And also for me to, to get to know uh, the variety and different offices that are existing here in Oslo. Um, after that, it took a while for me to, to land my first job. But actually what happened was that I, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't completely finished with the going abroad. So, I was looking uh, outside of Norway as well. And um, in, in the Netherlands, there was actually an opportunity for me as a Norwegian speaking architect to, to work abroad, but with a firm that has specialized in healthcare uh, that want to enter the Norwegian market. So it was a fantastic opportunity to me, for me to, to begin my career and get involved in a lot of um, phases and, and varieties of the, uh, the daily work of an architect going from, you know, uh, sketching and also to coordinating with uh, different disciplines and so on. So I, I was there in the Netherlands, uh, an office, about 100 people just outside of Rotterdam uh, for one year. And then it will became um, towards the end of the contract, uh, there was an opportunity for me to just transfer into a Norwegian firm, working also with uh, uh, health related architecture, um, which in fact was never, uh, something that I dreamt about during my studies, but it has shown to be a fantastic uh, new field within our, our world of, of work that added just so um, extra levels to, to what we do. And uh, yeah, I've found it really interesting. Um, so now I've been with the Nordic Office of Architecture for two years, uh, currently uh, in the role of architect and uh, detailing the um, new emergency room for the greater Oslo region, which is to be completed in 2023. It's very exciting. Um, they're erecting the building as we speak. There's a lot of concrete and steel and it's moving forward very fast. <laughs> That's fantastic. Evan, thank you so much. And it, what an exciting project to be working on as well. And um, I think it again, uh, like Amanda, having that opportunity to travel, but I suppose in through education, it was great for you. And again, also getting that opportunity to have that those two years on site ex experience um, stood to you as well. Um, such an interesting pathway, Evan. Uh, thanks very much for that. You're, um, I, I just have one question that I might just um, pass over maybe to Dennis again, uh, if that's okay. Um, I suppose what maybe was one thing that has, I suppose, helped your career to date, if you can probably make, maybe think of one thing. Wow, <laughs> that's um, it's it's what has helped my career to date. I think it's the to a huge. I, I, there's lots of things. Obviously, there's lots and lots and lots of things. I think um, 
there's no doubt as a student, I studied abroad for a short while. And I thought that was that was that was very it was very enlightening for lots of reasons, in the sense that you become you almost become um, dependent on your studio and the people around you and, and everything. Else. And when you go abroad, and particularly if you're working alone or in a small group um, in a different environment, um, it's, it's, it's quite it's remarkable. It's, it's quite a shock in some ways, but it's also incredibly enlightening that you and invigorating that you suddenly find, gosh, I do know one or two things. I, I can stand on my own two feet. And it also, it, it also teaches you to, um, to, 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 uh, to describe your work and to, and, and defend your work and, and also to, uh, to realize that you've, you've, you have responsibility for it. And that was very interesting for me. And I think it's to this day, those, so that short while I spent, I spent some time in Paris, has, um, has always stood to me. I, I think I, I have all my architectural sort of um, student memories. It's probably the one that stands out as foremost. So I think that was very, very, very informative. I think as I, as I qualified and I, start, I had the privilege of working for Andy Devan, who had worked in turn for, for Frank Lloyd Wright in the States. And I, I, I came into RKD as a, as a summer student and uh, worked for Andy Devan at that time. And, like, he was very charismatic. He was a very tough so-and-so to deal with in lots and lots of ways. There's no doubt about that, but, but he, he, hugely charismatic. And he, he, had a, he, had a, he, had, he had a wonderful appreciation for everybody in, in, uh, in the game, irrespective of who they were, the client, right down to the, dare I say it, the sort of person who made the tea and all, all in between. He realized that the team was terribly important. And that sort of uh, collegiate environment, which makes a team work really well, was terribly important. And to this day, that's something which I think has really stood to me. It's that, 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 that realization that as an architect, you have, you have very strong personal responsibility to, to what you do and to the people you do it for. And that's a very wide range of people. But you don't do it on your own. You do it with the help of other people. And I think it's I think there's two from that. The first is that that's very reassuring because um, you realize that the, the people are there, we are there to make things collectively. But the second thing is that realize that when you do come to work in a practice, when you do come to work in the in the in the sort of the, the big bad open world, actually it's not that bad at all because there are loads of people around you to help you and to make it happen. So that team environment is 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 is, is has definitely is hugely important. It's, um, it has been terribly important to me. Hopefully that goes some way to answer the question. That's a great answer, Dennis. Thank you so much. And uh, again, that that travel piece um, and, and having that opportunity to work in Paris and to be able to stand over your work, explain your work and take responsibility. Um, and I suppose getting the opportunity and understanding that working in a team is, is the norm. Um, and what is the, the pros of it is that you have that support there as well. And that it's not just the one person um, manning the, the boat, I suppose it's, it's, it's a team. Um, and yeah. I suppose, again, it's for, for students at the moment, it's like working on, on those, um, those soft skills and getting experiences of working within a team. Thanks very much, Dennis. Um, Amanda, um, is there anything perhaps maybe that has helped your career so far? We have a few questions that have come in before. Mm -hmm. So this is one of them. I thought it was quite interesting. Um, well, one of the things that I found is that, um, I don't want to actually badmouth our profession, but, I find being generous to other architects, being generous to peers. As, as a small practice, um, I, I, I can afford to be choosy about the type of work that I do, but also there's only a certain number of jobs that I can take on at any one time. So thankfully, I get a lot of calls and I have a list of architects of, of who do similar type of work. And I'll always, always have a conversation with someone who picks up the phone to ring my practice and I'll try to help them so that they're, they're, they take something away. Um, and I will give them a list of people and therefore other practices who may be looking for work. And then that comes around. So if you help other practices, they in turn will, 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 will help you. Um, and that in terms can lead to collaborations on projects for competitions that can also lead to getting a job in an office that maybe you've, you've, you've you know, you failed to maybe get a job there before. So I really think being generous um, the other thing I'd advise is that when you study architecture, you come from school and it's all consuming in UCD. And I know when I went to university with my friends and they did other subjects and I lost contact with them because UCD is, is full on. And part of that is great. You, you make, you know, lifelong friendships. But the other thing is that you get kind of railroaded into architecture. 
And really to be a good architect, you have to be passionate and it has to become your entire life. But at the same time, what I'd advise students and graduates is to step, take a step back, get involved in other activities, make sure you have a social circle outside of architecture. Architects don't become your clients. It's everybody else who does. And also, you know, inspiration and, and, and a well, uh, you know, a, a well-rounded architect is somebody who has, takes inspiration from other parts of life, from other people. So it's, it's, it's to try and, and, and push yourself. Um, and it can be hard to do that, whether it's continuing your rugby or your hockey um, or, or just even making a huge effort with your school friends. But that pays off once you graduate and you go out into the working world. So I would say, yes, get involved. Um, definitely network, go to architecture events, go to the AI lectures, go to the conference, you know, even if it's just to catch up with somebody, get to know people. And it's very easy to do that, um, particularly if you work in Ireland, because once you start working a couple of years, you end up knowing everybody. But even I found in other countries, you know, I ended up in Paris on my own. I couldn't speak French. Honestly, I was put in an office, had to answer the phone. I learned it in college, but I wasn't a linguist, but I was thrown in. So what did I do? I joined, I started going to the cinema on my own. I joined clubs. I joined the society. I went to lectures and suddenly I had job offers and suddenly I was going on tours on a Saturday morning. So am I rambling or lost the point, but, but more. So what helps your career? Helping other people, pays in dividends, get involved get out there, network and socialize. That's fantastic answer, Amanda. Thank you so much. It's, uh, so I suppose in some ways, building those relationships, both personally maintaining those and building those relationships professionally as well. And I think the importance of um, spending time and keeping your interests in those extracurricular activities throughout university, where there is probably that temptation to just focus on the academics um, is very important as well. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, and e Evan, over to you. Uh, is there yeah. any one thing perhaps that you think might have helped your career so far? Any advice that you could impart? Um, I must say, um, being an architecture student, you, you, you become very focused within your studies and also you might idolize certain names or offices or, or even a style of project that you'd like to get involved with but I think don't um, well always look for opportunities and analyze them as you go because I mean um, there's so many options that you have ahead of you and like like Dennis said uh, introductionary that um, our our degree is an extremely good base to sort of further educate yourself and also specialize yourself in certain areas. I, like I said, I hadn't dreamt that I would ever get involved with health architecture, but I've, within my first year, I, I dug really deep into what makes a good dementia home for those that use it and needs it and how can you make a safe environment uh, that they could live with because they don't necessarily see the way their environment as we do and um, with a diagnosis like that that progresses very um, severely over time at, and at the same time they live much earlier on in their life even though they're here today um, it's, it's just an extremely interesting thing to add on top of, uh, of our, our field and what we work with um, and now for the last year, especially, I've uh, gone into psychiatry and also detailing more in depth and actually realizing uh, those buildings that we've formed and shaped over so, so long time. And you know, yeah, I, I mean, look for opportunities because, I mean, we're, we're also at the same time in, a, in an environment and uh, of today that is constantly moving and um, a year ago or a little under a year ago we we didn't even know if we were going to be working well especially people in my age um if we were going to be put on leave or temporary leave or you know so then all of a sudden i realized that i have to look elsewhere to save to, to make sure that i have a safe income in the future gladly i've been lucky enough to stay with my firm but i ended up um looking for other opportunities and realized that actually i could i could um provide um, security measure 
uh, consultant for the um, the Ministry of Defense in Norway because uh, they put out uh, a, a job application and I. That's another thing I never dreamt of that we could, you know, provide our, our expertise and our background. Um, yeah, because what we learn at UCD and obviously other universities, but especially within architecture, I find is that you learn to sort of figure out what's your capacity and you also learn a great set of tools that you use to sort of tackle on new and um, not apparent tasks or things that you've never done before. Yeah. I think, Evan, absolutely. I think it's going back to Dennis uh, that opportunities, other opportunities exist. And I think that's very important. And sometimes it's, we don't realize until we kind of, we feel perhaps maybe we have to look and see, is there anything else out there? Are there other pathways? Are there other um, roles that we can bring our skills to? Um, so I think that's great advice, Evan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, I put myself on mute there. Um, um, and this is, I suppose, more of an uh, an, 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 an honest um, question. I am. It, um, I suppose it's asking you all if you have made any mistakes that you have learned from, um, and if you wouldn't mind imparting that, if you can think of anything at all. I think that's a very good question that came in. So, if you have made any mistakes, um, and what have you learned from it? Dennis, maybe will we start again? That's it. That's it. That's that's. You're, it's very horrible to ask me to answer that one first. I, I haven't even time to think. And the answer is yes, of course. And the, you know, I love that 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 adage. You know that the person who never made a mistake actually never made anything. And I think there's an enormous amount of truth in that. Um, yes, of course, I've made mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. Um, I think the the I think there's the the difference though is that recognizing a mistake. And 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 you know and realizing that it can be sorted, and that there's nothing we're we're about that is really life. It shouldn't be life threatening. <laughs> it rarely ever is, and realizing that and having the humility to to allow other people to help you with it is terribly terribly important. But recognizing the fact we make mistakes, of course we do, and there's simple things like forgetting to telephone somebody back and suddenly realizing, oh, good, damn it, I didn't do that. Now I'm now you know the job has gone elsewhere, or they're really they're really annoyed with me. Right down to not getting something out in time, which has 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 serious sort of statutory implications. Lots and lots and lots of things, but none of it, as I say, is life threatening. And the most important thing is to recognize it and do something with it. Um, the the it's, and and mistake you know if a mistake is 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 as a result of negligence of some sort well then you need to get a, a you give yourself a rap and a, a, a sort of on the on the wrist and say no that's not acceptable and it's not what we do though in any event but yes we do make mistakes we make them all the time and um, as I say without repeating myself I think recognizing them and having the humility to allow other people to help you with them and to be the very first thing about a mistake is to say guys i think i've screwed up here i've made a mistake and i you know how do we get ourselves out of this um and it's it's there you know it's 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 never worth having a sleepless night over and yet we do all the time um i think in terms of sort of career path mistakes in other words have i have i got myself trapped in the wrong place that's another type of mistake you can you can sort of fall into I've, oh gosh I've, again you know, it's nothing is nothing is final. Nothing is, is 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 fatal from that point of view. If you because again, if you're in a large practice for argument's sake, and people, we we umpteen over the many years, I've seen umpteen people who are simply mismatched in the role they are within the practice, and very often it's some it's a question of either somebody recognizing that or they recognizing it and and having the being open enough to say i'm not entirely happy with what i'm doing here and there's if there's if there's another opportunity i'd really like to exploit that you'll find you're pushing an open door every time people is nothing nobody wants anybody to be in a miserable place and if and and the person who's happy is the person who can help you most of all so if you do find yourself trapped in something you're really uncomfortable with and feel i've made a terrible mistake in doing that Again, acknowledge it and talk to somebody about it. It's really, really, it's revelatory. It'll, it'll, it'll work itself out. And if you make, you find yourself in a place that's a, not a good place, you, if people you're just not comfortable with, just move on. You know, don't be afraid. There's, there's opportunity there. And, you know, we all, we all sort of feel if we don't have a paid and pensionable job, we're sort of, we're, we're not in a great place. There's loads of opportunity in the world of architecture. And it's, it's, it's the one theme I'd come back to time and time again. So make your mistakes. 
acknowledge them, get over them. They're not, they're, they're, they're not going to be life threatening. I can promise you that. And I can tell you that I, I have the scars to, 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 I bear the scars from that. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I've made lots of them. And join the club, Dennis. I think we've all we've all made uh, lots of mistakes. Thanks very much, Dennis. That's fantastic. A very honest answer. Um, and the importance of recognizing mistake and understanding that it can be fixed. Um, and also, I suppose, the importance of asking for help um, going forward as well. Um, thank you, Dennis. Um, Amanda, over to you. You had a few more seconds, I think, to think, <laughs> think of how to answer this question. Sorry again, Dennis. Um, Amanda. I I say I would make mistakes every single day of my working life. I mean, as an architect, you know, you have to be of course, subject to where you work as an architect. But let's say in a practice like mine, you have to be uh, an excellent designer. You have to be excellent project manager. You have to be an excellent writer. You have to have excellent client relationship skills. You have to cover so many different aspects that unless you're a robot, you're going to make a trip up or have a mistake. And every day is a school day. Um, and like that, um, uh, uh, I, you know, I learn through the mistakes that I make. Um, when you when you ask that question to Dennis, I was thinking about um, both as a student and then I suppose as running an office, because one of the reasons why I decided to teach was to try and help students not make the same mistake that I did in college. I went through college and um, I loved it, um, but I think I I never really quite understood what I was doing. And yes, I qualified with an honours degree and, and that was fantastic, but I truly believe I never feel fulfilled my uh, potential in college. And I would just urge students, as I do my own students, to read. If you don't understand, ask. At some stages, I would have been very intimidated by the tutors, just in terms of their language. And I would stand up at a crit and I would leave and I wouldn't have a clue what anybody had said. And at that stage, there's no mobile phone. So now you can record things or jot things down. So I just think, uh, you know, I, I let so many opportunities go. And I would say that was a big mistake. And, and that's honestly the reason why I started teaching, was try to explain to students to get them to fully understand what they were doing so that they could reach their potential in college. The other mistake I think a lot of students make, and I know it's particularly now, is not looking after their health. And I think that's quite a, 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 a serious thing to look after. As I said, architecture is so full on. They're still working late hours. I hate that whole thing of, of all nighters. But, you know, and then we did start all smoking and drinking and not eating and just working away. So, you know, at the end of architecture, a whole lot of us came out of fifth year that summer. And we literally collapsed. I think I spent most of that summer lying on the grass in Stephen's Green. I was just worn out. And, and you know, so the other thing is, yeah, just, just keep an eye on, 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 on your health. Keep up your exercise. I know you're bored, silly, of hearing this all over the place now at the moment, particularly during COVID. But I just think for architecture students, in terms of the intensity of the work, that it is important. In terms of my own, then, then working, working as a practice, I suppose, Yes, I've made a lot of mistakes. What have I learned? Always be honest with your clients. You know, when I started with a practice and I was running behind, I was delayed with a project. And you know, the delays can be just because something is taking you longer to do, um, um, uh, or else you could have been delayed by a consultant, some external factors. But when I was young, my initial reaction was, I can't let a client down. And I'd lie and say, you know, maybe I had lodged a planning application when I hadn't. Um, and that's never a good thing, you know, and, and you learn from that. Be honest, be upfront, and you'll find that most clients completely appreciate that. They're working as well. They understand. So I learned that, you know, I think it was the first year of my own practice. I, I, I was terrified of a client and I lied about the data submission of a planning application and I lost a client. And rightly so, you, you know, honesty and trust is the most valuable thing with a client or with an employee so I'd always say that be honest don't be afraid you know talk to your clients and that leads on to minding your clients so any architect who's thinking of working for themselves you have to mind your clients you have to be respectful you have to be professional you know um but that as well you also have to be as careful choosing your clients as they are choosing their architect 
okay and you learn that through experience go with your gut you know if it doesn't feel right don't be tempted by that type of project and especially don't be tempted by the promise of projects down the line i've had many clients during my years where they promised me if i just do this project i'll do that you have to learn to value yourself as an architect for years architects have been taken advantage of poorly paid and poorly treated you have to value your work particularly your design work you have to be smart be business savvy don't be taken advantage of don't work for free and don't be poorly paid either so kind of i suppose just to sum it up really is, is to how, how would i sum that up mind your clients be honest be respectful be professional and don't be taken advantage of thanks very much amanda my gosh can i add words. can i can Sorry, um, can I can I echo something there, which is um, Amanda has uh, said, mind your clients, mind your, but mind yourself. Amanda made that point, and I think it's so, so important. And I think, uh, you know, we do, we do tend, and architecture is a funny game. People tend to, you get obsessed by something and you don't leave it and you go all night at it and everything else. To do that once or twice is fine, but don't make a habit of it. Look after your health. It's terribly, terribly important. And part of that is, is work-life balance. Don't don't exclusively do architecture. There's there's lots of other things in the world, and your architecture will be improved as a result of your experience of those things. It's um you know it's it don't don't think that by just consuming architecture you're going to be a better architect. You're actually not. And you're not going to, you're not going to be a better person for it. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no doubt about that. And I, I I really would echo what Amanda has said there from that point of view. Look after your look after yourself. It's really important and the people around you. Thank you, Dennis. Absolutely. And again, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Looking after your clients and looking after yourself, looking after your health, uh, physical and mental health is, is very important. Obviously, we have heard it, as you as you said, Amanda, we, we hear it every day, but we can't hear enough of it. We need to hear it every day, uh, particularly for architecture students who, who work incredibly hard um, every single day. Um, and I think the importance of respecting your client and being honest and open with your client, I think, is fantastic advice um and learning from your mistakes and for students um to read and to put their hand up and ask questions or, or virtually anyway now in these in these days but to ask questions um and that we're all human and the question that we probably are asking in the class probably the rest of the class need, need the answer as well um so thank you very much and i suppose building the relationships as well again so thank you amanda for that um evan um is there any mistakes um, that you have made that you have learned from? Oh, can, can, are you, I just, I think you may be muted there, Evan, or is it, yeah, try again. Um, I, I don't think I, we can't hear it. Maybe try again. Okay. Um, maybe I can hear you now, Evan. Do you want to just say hello? No, I can't. Um, there you Can go. I have? think yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Obviously, this another mistake. It's <laughs> no. We do, we learn from our mistakes, Evan. <laughs> There's no such thing as a mistake, and we've all done it before. So our, our the famous line from 2020-21 is "You're muted," or "Am I muted?" Or I think, <laughs> I, I, but, but but the great news is we can hear you now. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Thanks it's very much. Something to, to take into account. Don't. Don't, uh, <laughs> um, well, anyways. Um, Don't worry about the little things, Alarm exactly. Is, Thank is you. covered already by my, my colleagues here at the panel, but um, which one thing that is obvious, yeah, we, we stumble upon mistakes. It's part of our everyday. Um, and I'm not gonna repeat all of that that has been said, but I think a few things that is important is uh, while you're a student, do enjoy your time. Uh, I, I remember when I was studying, there was a, I don't know if they still say it at UCD, but we used to, to challenge the brief with like a, a quote that was like yelled out of uh, all, all around the studio <laughs> as soon as the professors left. Um, and, uh, and, but another thing is don't get too hung up on, on, on sort of covering all the softwares. I, I have to take this sort of the beginning architecture approach here, I guess. I can't speak for many years of experience, 
because at the end of the day, when you arrive at an office, uh, they usually have their systems. And then, so I guess my advice is to be, to be open to, to tackle and be eager to learn um, how they do things where you end up and, and rather to, to be prepared using the tools that they're using, go more into what, what is the firm doing that you would like to get involved with and, and, uh, and find yourself a firm that you uh, would like to be, um, uh, wh where you share the values, I guess, and uh, where they have interesting work that you would like to learn from is, is something instead of, um, yeah, learning, you know, all these, there's tons of, of uh, softwares that we use, but there's only a handful that they use at a single firm. So there's no need to, to waste your time. Um, covering them all, I guess, yeah. Thanks, Evan, that's very good advice. Um, I suppose doing your research and, and looking at what company you want to work for and what, what projects they're working on and do you want to work on their projects? What tools are they using? And I suppose closing your gaps um, and focusing on that particular firm and, and how you would help them, I suppose, and how you would progress within the firm. Thanks very much, Evan. Um, I have a kind of, I suppose we're, we are flying through time here. Um, we have a few more minutes. So um, I think students would be interested, I suppose, in the area of applications. Um, so if they are applying for perhaps an internship or a graduate role. Um, so there's a question here, I think it's quite interesting. Um, if you are involved in that hiring process, um, what do you like to see in an application for from a student, what would you like to see in that application? It, you, you can discuss portfolio, you can discuss CV, cover letter. Um, so, Dennis, again, sorry for picking you first. Maybe I should pause for no a few whatsoever. minutes <laughs> to prepare an answer. Um, is there anything that you personally like to see in that application? In the application itself, I think the I think something which gives uh, as best as it possibly can without being overly complicated, a cross section of your experience is really important. Um, there's nothing, it's a funny thing to say, we're all, we're all almost jaundiced by really glitzy presentations and you know CGI's and all the kind of stuff that we, 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 sell, we sell to our clients all the time. And at the end of the day, it's a bit samey, it's a bit so what. If somebody, uh, if somebody gives us a very sort of a simple resume of themselves and their interests and what they've done and, what, and, and, and the sort of things that they, the, the methods they've used in doing that, I think that's really important. There's nothing in, I personally love to draw and I've always loved to draw. And it, it's, I, I, consider, I, I consider it very, a, a very important tool in terms of my sort of my design um, method as it were. And I love to see drawings. I love to see simple hand drawing sketches that people have prepared, which really are about describing the process as, a, as, as opposed to the finished article. Because at the end of the day, architecture is about process. And the finished article is almost fait accompli, you know, once you've gone through that proper process. So I think a portfolio of that is, is, is multifaceted in a sense. It shows a nice sort of a photograph of a model, some nice sketches. The, 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 the thing that generated the finished product, and of course, a nice draw which shows the scheme that that in a portfolio is very nice i also think it's one's other interests are, are of, of it's always very interesting to read that somebody's you know plays football for such and such or they have an interesting uh, hobby that's completely you know they might fly a kite for example i mean some all sorts of things that be a hot air balloonist and i want to meet somebody like that that's that's that brings another dimension to what we, we what we're about and i think that's that, that's really really important and I think the because uh, I, it because it what it does it demonstrates enthusiasm, and I think that's really important. When I'm interviewing somebody and having having you know read an application and being um, sort of enthused by it, then when you meet somebody and you interview them, be it over over, over Zoom or Teams or in, in person, whatever else, the one thing that you're really looking for, you, we're not looking for 
Mies van der Rohe to walk into the office uh, fu sort of fully qualified with, with, with a brilliant portfolio of work. What we want to, to meet is somebody who's really enthusiastic and is excited about being part of the, of, uh, part of the organization, part of the team, meeting people and, and making architecture happen. Uh, because that's what architecture is about. It's about people. So it's, being personable is terribly important and, and demonstrating that. And the vast, the, by far the vast majority of, of people studying architecture are interesting people. They've chosen the career because they're, they're interested in things. They're creative people. That's really important, that creativity. So don't hide your light under a bushel. Tell, tell people what you're like and, and, and try and demonstrate your enthusiasm and the method you employ. I think that's really important. That to me is terribly, terribly important. Hopefully make that some, make some sense. That, that I'm sure there are a million other things there, which, which are, you know, but we'll, we'll come to those. That makes total sense, Dennis. Thanks very much. And I, I think it's important for students, I suppose, to realize that uh, companies like to see the process like to see the sketches, like to see the, the, the pathway before the end result. Um, and I think also I suppose, the importance of bringing and adding on the CV that extra interest and achievement section, which I think a lot of students decide they don't want to add that little piece in. It's, um, it's they want to focus on the academics, um, but it's important to focus on those interests and achievements as well. Um, because sometimes that's the USP, that's that's the thing that makes you stand out from, from other people. And as you say, uh, Dennis, it's an opportunity at interview to talk about that. And it might be an opportunity to you for you to see the student, I suppose, or the graduate stand out and talk about something that they really love as well as architecture. Um, so I think um, that's very important. Thank you, thank you, Dan. I think I think it is important. And sorry to I, I don't want to capitalize this, but or, or to monopolize this. But I, I think it's um, it's terribly terribly important to also remember. It comes back to something that Evan said, which I think is really interesting, which is don't be afraid to ask. You, you know, that's there. There are no stupid questions, and even at, in the interview process, in that I, you don't come in pretending you know it all none of us know it all you'll never we never know it all and that's exactly why we're doing what we do because it's, we're in a world of exploration we want to know more and you know, i don't expect somebody to come in and to know how to use all the systems we employ in the practice for example or to know how we do things or to know how to make a planning application or all the even to answer a phone i always remember when i joined rkd first i was terrified of answering the phone it was it was it was it was the prospect of talking to somebody strange uh, about technical things at their end was beyond me. I really, I would look at the phone ringing and say, oh, good God, would somebody else answer it? <laughs> Don't be afraid of all of that. That's part and parcel of, we're all like that. And bit by bit, you grow more familiar with these things. And that's fantastic. And But don't pretend to know it all. And I, as I say, nothing beats the a, a, a keenness and enthusiasm and demonstrating that in whatever way you possibly can. Be really honest about it. People will like you for it. And also remember that an interview is a two way, it, it, it comes to interview, interview is a two way trade. You must also be interviewing the person who's interviewing you. You've got, you know, I want people to want to work with me. I'm, I, I, want, I want to work with people I want to work with, but likewise, I want them to want to work with me if you get that. Absolutely, Dennis. Um, and I think it, I suppose it's, it's going back to what Evan mentioned about working, deciding who, what company you want to work with. and. Don't, you don't have to have everything. You don't have to have every tool in, in the toolbox um, and bringing that energy. And I suppose bringing that opportunity and letting them know that you're willing to learn. You're, you're, you're bringing skills um, of the academics and the qualifications, but you're also bringing that energy um, and, that, and, and that willingness to learn. Thanks very much, um, Dennis. Um, Amanda? Yeah, so I just, I have a couple of points, but again, just to follow up on, on Dennis um, in terms of, of showing what a well-rounded person you are in your CV, because design is unfortunately only a very small part of working in an architectural practice. And only a very small number, percentage of architects are good designers. Um, so most architects uh, not most, a lot of architects will go on to specialise in other fields of architecture, which I think is one of the brilliant things about our degree, because you can go out to academia, research, housing agency, you know, there's, there's just a variety of things. So, again, I think every practice or office needs um, individuals with different skill sets, because that's what makes a good practice. People who are, are skilled at a variety of different types of things, not everybody has to be a good designer. Um, 
So just going back to myself in terms of, of, of employing people, um, at the moment um, I, I, I work for myself. Um, over the years I've had uh, transition year students and I've always had year out students um, uh, and teaching in the School of Architecture is a great way of, 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 of finding students. But in terms of CVs, I get loads of CVs every day. And because I, I'm just by myself, I don't have time to go through them all. But at the same time, I feel I feel pretty ignorant for people who are putting this effort together and I don't get around to responding to them. So how do I pick out a good CV? A good CV for me is something that's well designed. If I see a CV that's well designed, that gives me confidence that that person can write a letter, that that person may design a building, that that person can represent the practice to a client so that the way you do everything the way you sign your name the way you align your your experience just the way you set out so think about your cv as you would a building keep it brief absolutely good work you know you see a cv that's well designed i will then go and look at the work if the work is good it'll stand out and then I'll read about the rest of the students. You know quite often the best students in, in the architecture colleges don't make it in an office. And sometimes students who are struggling, you know, we all develop at different stages. Right? Sometimes some of the students who struggle and fail and, you know, work the way to college end up being and producing the most beautiful work and winning Oriego medals, as has happened to, to members of, 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 of my year. So, so, you know, you're only just starting out. Um, um, so it's all really about finding your way, I suppose, in architecture. But getting back to the question in hand, a CV for a year out student um, or, or any, any student, it, it's all about catching the eye um, and looking well. Again, for small practice, this wouldn't work in a larger practice because you have to go through um, um, uh, uh, people answering the phones. Um, but for me, follow up with a phone call. I like hearing from people. And I have a chat with them. And if I don't have a job, which always happens, I might pass them on to, um, uh, for example, my, 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 my husband has a larger architectural practice. And quite often I have phone calls with, with students and I, I'm really interested in what they're saying. And I'll pass them on here or I'll pass them on to my friends. So bring them, do a little bit of research on the practice. You know, what I get a lot is I get emails for other people, you know, don't send the same CV out to everybody. And this applies to graduates as well, you know, and I get emails from, from, from graduates set, talking about work that I didn't do. So if you're interested in working in practice, look at the website, you know, Google the people, maybe read about the work. And that always starts a good conversation. You know, if somebody rings me, they sent in their CV, and then they start talking about something. But I suppose from my end of things, I, I'm old school. And I, I find somebody who makes a phone call is making an effort, but I think that will only really work in a small practice. Um, uh, it might need to be, you might necessarily get to the people who are employing in a larger practice. Um, and then just be very careful about typos and grammar. You know, I could see beautiful work and a beautiful CV and I see a spelling and I just go, well, that's it. You know, don't rely on spell check, auto check, this whole thing of way words are, are changed into the Americanized spelling. Um, uh, that's just a no-go, I suppose. Um, so, so to summarize it, it would be design your CV well, keep it brief. Yes, include your beautiful work, but talk about yourself. Follow it up with a phone call. Do research on the practice uh, that you'd like to work in. Thanks very much, Amanda. That's great advice kind of a nice, clean, clear, brief, well-designed CV. And I suppose a cover letter demonstrates an opportunity, demonstrates that you have the skills to write a, a professional formal formal letter and use professional language um, and demonstrates all the skills that are required. Um, I think that's very Im important. And I suppose, as you mentioned, that tailoring piece, it's so important that you are tailoring your CV and cover letter and application to the company and make sure that you are addressing the application to the correct person. Very good advice. Thanks very Actually, much, Amanda. Sorry, there was just one thing, sorry to put in. I, um, I've just I've noticed it particularly because everyone's a Zoom. Um, presentation is very important. And, and uh, first impressions, um, uh, uh, you know, what's that expression that's gone out of my head? They last, but when you're going for an interview, you need to look and dress like a professional. 
because you will be in the face of that. You will be going out and you'll be meeting clients. So if you're having an interview over Zoom, have a look at your background. I don't want to see your bunk beds. You know, you can get, I had a, an interview with someone recently Zoom, and they had a French student actually, they had an image of my work as their background. And I just thought that was brilliant, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's just be presentable. Yeah. I'll stop speaking. <laughs> Very good advice, Amanda, in this in this new virtual world that we're working in at the moment. Um, thanks very much, Amanda. Um, Evan, um, we're coming up to, to the end, but um, as I suppose, dare I say, re recent graduate, um, is there anything that you could advise or is there anything that perhaps maybe you put into your application that um, you felt stood to you? Um, uh... I don't know, it's very hard to say. I, I haven't been on the other side of the table skimming through these uh, applications and CVs, but you know, um, I think a few things that is important to take from, from both uh, Dennis and Amanda is that um, keep it brief, uh, talk about yourself. And if you can add anything particular, like don't be afraid of uh, going out and get involved, uh, being at a workshop or being at a voluntary, work or, or yeah or even um hobbies that you are especially interested in i think all of those things uh, benefit your cv and then yeah don't hand out a bible because i don't know if this is the truth but at least what i refer to when i sort of try to shape and put together my cv is that if you're lucky enough to get somebody to look through your work, then they, the most time they will spend on it is probably a minute. So, yeah, I'm sure that my <laughs> fellow panelists can confirm or not, but uh, I, I think yeah, in the end, don't hand over a full Bible or novel. That's I, I, Evan. I think yeah, absolutely. It's it's suppose it's echoing um, what, what Dennis and, and Amanda are saying in relation to keeping it brief. So the CV and the cover letter, it's not actually going to get you the job. It's really just to get them interested in what you look like on paper, I suppose, and an opportunity to go to the next stage of the process, as in the interview. So I think absolutely keeping yeah. that information brief and concise to the point, using strong action verbs. Um, but not a whole five, six, seven, eight pages, because from, from what we hear also, that it only takes about 30 to 60 seconds to actually look through your CV. And I think that's very important for students to, to understand that somebody's not taking a cup of coffee and sitting down and like, like a book, it, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's, it's a brief scan. So the information on your CV and cover letter needs to be brief as well. I think that's fantastic advice, Evan. Thank you so much. Um, and it, it's actually 7 p.m. on the dot, everybody. So um, I just want to say thank you so much to you, Dennis, to you, Amanda, and to you, Evan, for taking the time today um, to speak with us all. I know the students um, very much appreciate your time, very much appreciate all the advice that you imparted today.